Good afternoon and welcome to today's webinar. My name is Charles Green and I'm part of the marketing team here at Bellatrix Software and I'm going to be your host today. This is actually our last webinar of 2018 and as we usually do in December, we're going to focus on what we expect to see in the coming year. Now, just very quickly, for those of you not familiar with Bellatrix, we are a leading provider of software development services. We have offices in New York and Silicon Valley, as well as throughout several countries in Latin America. We work with uh, clients ranging from cutting-edge startups to established Fortune 500 companies, and we work with these organizations in turning their ideas into powerful and engaging software products. Now, as we work with our customers, we often come into conversation about their priorities and what they're looking to achieve in the future and their objectives. So for this webinar, we have taken those conversations and we've distilled them into four key predictions, which we're going to get to shortly. Um, but to help put these predictions together, I've been helped enormously by Bellatrix experts Alejandro Rodriguez and Javier Osorio, and they're also on the line today. Um, firstly, Ali, would you like to introduce yourself to the audience? Uh, yes, of course. Hello, everyone. My name is Alejandra Rodriguez, and I am part of the marketing team here at Bellatrix. And I work hand in hand with Charles and Javier to create industry leading thought leadership. Super. Thank you. And Javier? Thank you very much, Charles. Yes, indeed. My name is Javier Osorio, and I'm part of the marketing team as a content marketer here at Bellatrix. Super, thank you. Um, and before we get started, I um, just want to remind everyone that uh, if you do want to ask us a question, please do so. Um, you can do so either via uh, the chat box on the bottom right hand side of your screen or on Twitter where we'll be live tweeting using the hashtag predictionsBSF. But without further ado, I want to jump into the content. And uh, well, as you see here, that's our, our photos of the panelists from today. Um, but to set the scene for now for the rest of the presentation, um, I want to first talk about how we see companies continuing with their digital journeys. When we look at the research and when we look at what some of the industry analysts, such as uh, you know, companies such as Forrester Research and Gartner, are saying about what is happening, when we look at that research, we see that more than half of organizations surveyed um, in 2018 stated that they are currently underway with their digital transformation initiative. Now, such an initiative um, is not just a, a one-off event, it's a process, it's a journey. Um, and you know, it really involves examining and implementing a broad range of new technologies, uh, along with reviewing uh, and, and revitalizing everything from a company's culture to creating new metrics, processes, and leadership positions. So digital trans transformation is not just the buzzword, but rather it gets to the profound shift that companies are going through, and we're going to see that accelerating um, in the next 12 months. And what does it really mean? It means being able to respond more quickly and effectively to changing customer requirements, becoming closer to your customer. It also means building the organizational structure to enable these changes to take place and looking to methodologies such as agile development, which really provide the, the framework for an organization to respond quickly and efficiently to, to market changes and then iteratively change and then improve. Um, and so putting that into perspective, we um, and using that as the, as the basis, together we came up with four key predictions uh, for this presentation. The first one being uh, looking at artificial intelligence artificial intelligence. How will AI change how we develop and test software? What does it mean for programmers? What does it mean for developers? Um, our second prediction uh, looks at augmented reality and how AR is going to shape uh, the future of UX design. When we're creating these new compelling user experiences, how can we use the latest technology? Uh, and how can we use the developments in augmented reality to create these powerful experiences? Thirdly, we're going to talk about um, how new technologies, in particular Google Flutter, provides businesses with new opportunities. How does Google Flutter enable us, enable us to create these new powerful uh, mobile applications which, which customers love to use? And then finally, we're going to talk about the idea of leapfrogging, that by using new digital technologies, companies are going to be able to jump ahead of incumbent competition uh, in, in, the coming, uh, in, the coming, uh, in the coming few years. So taking that, I want to now pass over to Javier to dive deeper into our first prediction all about artificial intelligence. 
Okay, thank you very much, Charles. Yes, so we're going, we're going to talk about how artificial intelligence will change how we develop and test software. <clears throat> so, first of all, it's important to get to know that artificial intelligence is not something new. It's already been here for almost 70 years. Um, the speed at which companies are investing in it is increasing, increasing year by year. Uh, actually, in, as highlighted by Tech Republic, just in 2017, the adoption of artificial intelligence grew over 60%. So, uh, first of all, let's get to understand what is artificial intelligence. Um, according to HFS research, AI is basically any kind of formulaic code or algorithm that instructs the software how to process and learn from input data. After this, vast quantities of data are um, analyzed. Uh, there are recognized several patterns which later are used by the same algorithms to interpret what may happen next, the future data. Um, so artificial intelligence is composed of several technologies or branches itself. Um, for example, uh, there are there is machine learning, deep learning, computer vision, natural language processing, and cognitive assistance, amongst many others. And, thanks, and it's thanks to these different branches that developers are now able to create better software. So, for instance, let's, let's talk a bit about deep learning. <clears throat> so, deep learning actually represents the most advanced extension of the machine learning. And it basically consists of models, or what is also known as artificial neural networks, with multiple, multiple hidden layers. These hidden layers represent the ability of the nets, of these nets that are uh, formed, you know, the, to execute more computational comparisons of input data. So um, a, a good way to compare this is what happened with uh, the central processing units or processors of computers, where instead of having one just stream of uh, processing power, big companies such as Intel or AMD chose to have multiple cores working at the same time. So the, actually when you have multiple cores running at the same time, it is more efficient, therefore uh, more computational and more processing power. It's more or less the same what happens with deep learning. It's just like several layers that execute at the same time, therefore it can create more networks. <clears throat> there is a very interesting use case um, uh, that happened with computer scientists at Rice University at Houston, Texas, where they created a deep learning software coding application they called Bayou. So, um, in a nutshell, what Bayou does is that it helps human programmers by writing chunks of code in response to keywords. So, basically, what you can do is you just type a keyword into your uh, editor into your code editor and straight away by you recognizes what you're trying or analyzes this data you just gave him and upon this input data it gives you like several chunks of code that you may want to to add or to put into your into your development <clears throat> according to science daily about Bayou. When a user asks Bayou questions, the system makes a judgment call about what program it's being asked to write. Then it creates sketches for uh, for several of the most likely candidate programs the user might want. So it's like kind of intuitive uh, yeah, approach towards uh, software development. <clears throat> Other use cases of AI and software development involve what is known as cognitive assistants. These are basically programs that process inputs. It may be either voice commands, it can be machine learning, it can be natural language processing, and or other AI technologies to generate an action and achieve a goal for the user. So uh, most of the ones, the most commercial ones right now on the market are, uh, for instance, Microsoft's Cortana, uh, Amazon's Alexa, and Apple's Siri. So uh, to illustrate better this example, uh, let's have a brief uh, question to, to Siri, to Apple Siri right now. Hey Siri, what does Siri mean? contradictory meanings, none of which I am at liberty to discuss. Sorry about that. 
So many of you may already know Siri, of course. It is the most commercial and most like hyped technology uh, around uh, available to us. And it's basically upon like voice commands, what I just did. It This is the input data that it has and it analyzes what I just asked and replies either maybe with a, a slight humorous response like what happened right now or depending on, on what I actually asked her to do for me. <clears throat> there are other like um, enterprise level approaches such as virtual scrum master agents and virtual testing advisors that uh, help uh, in a great way developers in their in their developing processes. So um, now let's uh, go on to what actually people should do, what you should do with artificial intelligence next year. So it is very interesting because artificial intelligence has gained uh, an interesting level of maturity right now. Uh, the hype has lowered since it first started a couple of years ago, like really mainstream. And right now we're already starting to see like real use cases. This is very similar to what happened with blockchain uh, back then in 2017. It was a very new technology. There was, everybody was super hyped upon it and people started to invest on it without even knowing what actually blockchain was and how it worked and how this public ledger could benefit their uh, companies. So right now artificial intelligence already has once again, lowered its hype and people do know what it really works and ha now you can see uh, real cases of, of, of its benefits. Um, so yeah, despite the growth that it had in adoption, a few companies like really understood what AI could, could bring to them. According to Forrester's predictions 2019, uh, in a report called um, I'm sorry, on, an AI, uh, on a report of Forrester called Prediction 2019, expect a pragmatic vision of AI. They say that firms are starting to recognize what it is and what it's not, what it can do and what it cannot. And they are already seeing the real changes of AI versus what they assumed the challenges would be. So once again, yeah, they're starting to actually uh, recognize what they can, it can, this technology can do for them. So uh, bearing this in mind, um, it's important to focus on data collection since it's the main input for AI. So for, uh, data collection should be on the roadmap since 60% of decision makers at companies adopting AI cite that data quality is quite challenging. Um, as for the role of the developer, the future of programming demands a slight shift since the developer has to become kind of a teacher, a curator of training data. It has to understand kind of a data analyst and an analyst, analyst of these results. As Alex Robio, our president and co-founder states at a Forbes article called How Will AI Impact Software Development? Software development will not disappear. Instead, developers will start to think of themselves and their role in much different terms. So developers have to think like the, there is, might be a, a shift in the role and they have to think themselves as data analysts and not just like coding itself. Now we've we finished, I'm gonna pass on the word to uh, my colleague Alejandra that she's gonna to, going to talk about augmented reality in UX design. Yes, of course. Thank you, Javi. So uh, augmented reality has become one of the most disruptive technologies and it has multiple applications in a variety of fields from healthcare to education and it's generating impact on the way we create experiences. So we are already seeing how Apple's Arkit and Ikea's augmented reality app are at our fingertips. So in order to understand why AR poses challenges and benefits to designers, it's important to clarify its definition. Unlike virtual reality, which creates a fully simulated environment, AR combines information of the real world with program and interactive elements with the objective to enhance our perception of reality. This means there is a constant conversation between devices and the real world. So what AR does is to analyze and interpret information responding dynamically to the user's gestures and movements and to changes in the environment. This means the user has little control over the interface by means of commands. And this is one of the most important differences between traditional UX experiences and augmented reality experiences. 
So let's take a look at the challenges of building user experiences with AR. Firstly, it's more tricky to define a target audience because users can be everywhere. As you might know, AR experiences are more and more designed for public spaces. According to the UX Design Magazine, there are two types of users in these kind of experiences, intended and unintended users. Intended users are those who are directly involved in the experience, while unintended users are the people unintentionally involved in it. So a good example of this is the famous game, Pokemon Go, which involves pretty much any public space and the experience of the players might affect others who are not directly involved. So as a result, designers will have to think about how to avoid effective, affecting unintended users in a negative way and how to keep intended users safe. And this point actually leads us to the second challenge for designers, which is safety. So as we already mentioned, AR is about enhancing the user's experience instead of replacing it, which means designers need to keep their AR experiences simple so users won't be distracted entirely by, by a superimposed image. So adding too much layers of information might compromise safety, which was the case of Pokemon Go because it increased the number of car accidents in the US. So a good strategy to ensure safety is to design experiences within a narrow depth of field. If interfaces show information within a specific range, they will be more effective in providing useful information in real time and when necessary. And this also ensures not to obstruct the user's line of sight. So in order to define your target audience while ensuring safety, the UX process needs to focus on understanding the human body and the user's natural interaction with reality. <clears throat> so this means that UX research looks differently when building AR experiences. So during this phase, designers will need to focus less on interviews and surveys and more perhaps on methods like contextual inquiry and field studies, which observe users in their natural environments. To augment reality, we need to know what is it we are going to augment. And also during the UX research, designers ask questions to get to know better their audience. So those questions are, who are our users? What do they expect from our product? What are they currently using? And so on. But in this case, questions should be more related to the users and their context. So good examples of these are, where do you expect users to experience this augmentation? Who else might be involved in this experience? And how is this going to affect the natural movements and interactions of people with reality? But so far we have talked a lot about the challenges, but what are the benefits of a good AR experience? So the benefits of augmented reality in user experiences are highly related with psychology and visual interaction, and also with the fact that AR experiences are non-common user interfaces. So firstly, they decrease the interaction cost which is the number of steps required to complete a task and the sum of physical and mental efforts to interact with an interface. So put simply, there will be less reading, less scrolling and less typing. <clears throat> also, AR experiences reduce the cognitive, the cognitive load. It doesn't require users to learn commands so they can easily and naturally navigate through the interface. Also, as there is a limited amount of information that the brain can process, AR done right avoids overwhelming users engaging them with the interface. And as a result, the user will remain focused on the interface and there will be less attention switches. So to illustrate a little bit these concepts, I would like to take an example from Medium. Think about when you have to build anything at home using instructions. For instance, a chair. Usually, these instructions come in brochures or booklets with a very tiny and long text. So when you're starting to put together the pieces, you have to follow steps, remember a lot of information, and compare what you just did with the instructions to check you are going the right way. Now imagine that you're building the chair with the help of an augmented reality application. When you open the box, the technology will detect all the pieces and it will highlight the first parts that you need to assemble. So when you pick them up, the application will show you an animation of how they should be put together 
And once you're done with this, the app will do the same for the rest of the pieces. This means the application is reducing the interaction cost and cognitive load, as users don't have to process and memorize big amounts of information, and it doesn't require users to lear learn commands and, and keep them focused on what they're doing. And as a result, users will execute tasks faster and easier. And this brings enormous benefits for sales, marketing, and advertising. AI is becoming one of the most powerful means for storytelling, and it is ideal for building brand loyalty and for generating positive emotions and responses from users when they interact with interfaces and products. For instance, applications such as IKEA's Plays allow users to visualize how their houses would look like with different decoration. And according to Median, 72% of AR users report that they made unplanned purchases because of AR influence. And it's because thanks to AR, users have the option to try things before buying them, and they don't have to be in the store to do this. This means it unifies online and offline experiences, which is one of the most important principles of an omnichannel experience. So what is our recommendation for designers and executives? So designers who have successfully created AR user experiences are rethinking their UX processes to adapt their practices and harness the possibilities that this technology provides. Designing experiences within a range of 360 degrees requires understanding that both the environment and the people change unexpectedly. Also, it's very important to evaluate how these new possibilities regarding user experiences might change what is socially accepted in public spaces and how experiences that typically happen inside people's homes are now taking place outside on the streets. Also, we highly encourage executives to prepare their UX design teams to embrace AR and to start thinking about AR experiences for mobile devices, as it is how the majority of people will be in contact with this new technology. And also, we encourage you to see the benefits of AR not only for end users, but also, for instance, to resolve problems in the workplace. And finally, this might be the, the most important advice keep users at the center of your AR experiences. Don't neglect people and keep in mind that technology is a means to solve a problem, but it's not the end by itself. Okay, so now it's time for our next prediction. So I'll hand over the presentation to Hale. Thank you very much, Hale. That was quite interesting indeed. So <clears throat> right now we're going to talk about our third prediction, which is new technologies such as Google Flutter provide new business opportunities. <clears throat> so first of all, let's talk about what is Flutter. In mid-2017, Google launched the release preview of Flutter. It is basically a free open source mobile user interface framework that allows developers to build native apps on both uh, OSs such as iOS and Android from just one single code base. So uh, why is it so important or why is it so uh, groundbreaking uh, Flutter for developers? Well, basically the idea of being able to develop software for both OSs from one single code is really attractive. It, it is a time saver and it increases efficiency a lot in development teams. Also, there is um, Flutter's got, got uh, a key feature called Hot Reload that enables developers to change code on the spot and see it live like right away, right away without losing the state of the app. So you can basically change code and see how it works or not on, on, the, on, the, on, the, on the overall result straight away. So this improves developer productivity um, a lot. Also, it has the possibility to integrate with code editors or IDEs, as it's called in the industry, such as Android Studio, IntelliJ IDEA, and VS Code or Visual Studio Code at any time of the workflow process. So you can actually implement Flutter at any time, no matter what is the state or the the time at which you're where you're working on the development process. Um, talking about a little bit about the use cases that Flutter has uh, right now, its showcase is quite interesting. Despite being released quite recently, it's, it already, its showcase already has 
big names such as Alibaba, which is the uh, world's biggest online commerce company located in China. No wonder it has more than 50 million downloads already only with its release preview. So it's basically a gallery like what you can find maybe on other retail companies such as e eBay where you can just like stroll around and yeah, scroll through different through different uh, items and purchase like a shopping cart. Um, according to Rodney Axtolfer, the CEO of Aerium, which is an airline software startup, he states three key reasons why companies and startups should consider using Flutter. Firstly, it increases the speed and productivity of development teams. Secondly, it is, according to him, truly multi-platform and it, thirdly it helps create beautiful crisp user interfaces easily like if they were native at the beginning so um what is the challenge that flutter uh yeah proposes there are several cross platform alternatives right now in the market such as react native xamarin and angular js or angular that's it itself however as bellatrix's president and co-founder alex robio highlights in the article google flutter why ctos should pay attention to it which is a must read the challenge however is that cross platform development is difficult in many cases despite despite best efforts the user experience simply lags behind the that of truly native apps. So with the promise that uh, Flutter brings is that you can develop software only just one code and they will look just as good and as awesome as the ones that came, as the native apps that come with your phone or your mobile device. So uh, now that we know already what is Flutter and how it works, why should we pay attention to it. Why is it important to Flutter? Uh, first of all, it provides new business opportunities because it addresses the major pain points present in mobile development. For instance, companies can save time and resources when develop it, developing an app since it only has to be coded once. So the workflows, of course, would be like tremendously benefited from this. And added to this, timelines are shortened due to Flutter's hot, hot reload feature, which we talked uh, recently, which enables developers to work faster and more effectively. And this leads to faster development uh, times, of course. So our recommendations about what you should do with Flutter is, well, just a few days ago, Google announced the release of uh, Flutter 1.0, which is a uh, Google's uh, user interface toolkit for mobile software development from a single code base. So uh, we would say it is a good time to get your hands dirty with it, download it, test it, get familiar with its look and feel, compare it with other frameworks and he see how it works for you and for your development uh, teams. It is important here to uh, remember that Flutter is open source, which means that it is supported not only by Google, but the community around it, the community that downloads and tests and everything is super important for open source uh, yeah, softwares. So constant feedback is a valuable resource that would improve Flutter as versions are released. So if you're able to download and see any bugs or any kind of stuff that you might think will make the software in the long run work better, it would be important reasonably to just like, yeah, provide some feedback and this will just make a better software like in a community wise thinking. <clears throat> and um, finally, we would recommend to not just download it because it's hyped or because you heard about it or because you uh, are interested just in it, but to get to know what it really does. Flutter is optimized for two dimension or 2D mobile apps that want to run on both Android and iOS. Apps that need to deliver brand first designs are particularly well suited for Flutter. However, apps that need to look like stock platform apps can also be built on it. So in this order of ideas, it is possible to build few, few uh, sorry, full future apps that include gadgets from your mobile device such as camera, the GPS, network storage or third-party SDKs amongst many others in order for you to understand and see how it really works therefore see if it's suited or if it can actually benefit the developments that your company are working on or thinking of working on.
Now, uh, finally, let's go to our fourth predictions, which uh, with um, my colleague um, Charles Green. Super, thank you, Javier. Um, as Javier mentioned, this is our fourth and, and final prediction, uh, and that is it's slightly different from the previous three predictions in the sense of it's slightly more conceptual in, in nature. Um, and the first first thing to note about the concept of leapfrogging is that it's not a new concept. Um, traditionally, researchers have used it to talk about how countries in the developing world have quickly adopted new technologies to skip generations of technological advances. So, for example, a, a country in, in the developing world would go from stage one to stage three. Um, and th that contrasts with how countries in, in Europe and the US, uh, for example, have gone have moved more gradually over time, going from stage one to stage two to stage three uh, with respect to their technological development. And, and the classic example here is that of mobile technology. So here, you know, with, with the introduction of cell phones and mobile technology, that means that countries could skip the, the fixed line technology that drove the internet revolution in places like, uh, like Europe and the US. Now, at Bellatrix, we work with fast-moving startups in various industries, and what we're seeing is a very similar dynamic playing out, but, and that is by using the power of power of digital, uh, we're seeing how company, how organizations can rapidly jump ahead of their incumbent competition. Um, and we're seeing that taking place, for example, in fintech, uh, where you're seeing financial services companies are looking to see how they can use these new digital uh, technologies to jump ahead uh, of, um, of incumbent competition. Um, research for the World Economic Forum focused on this, and they highlighted how it makes how leapfrogging makes it possible for enterprises to rapidly gain competitive edge. They, they uh, highlight the potential for startups and, and, and companies to overtake their, their to overtake their established competition. And in the case of, of fintech, um, you know that is a case where uh, many fintechs are now providing new types of banking services which weren't previously available. And here, we can, for example, we can look to to Latin America, where in the region you'll find many people uh, who are either unbanked, which means they they don't have uh, not using any kind of financial services, or they're underbanked underbanked, where they're not taking advantage of all the uh, financial services which should be available to them. For example, perhaps you know they, they could be helped by getting a mortgage for a house or by getting some credit services to, to start, uh, start a business. Um, and so in many, in many cases, in many countries, uh, those people uh, have not previously been able to access uh, financial services and new fintech uh, organizations are making such services available to them. And just to give one uh, concrete example of that, for example, here here at Bellatrix, uh, we work with a financial organization to use biometrics and, and selectively selected publicly available data to enable people to open a bank account in an instant. Um, and such financial services help promote financial inclusion and reduce extreme poverty. So really what you're seeing here is that by, by leapfrogging and by using new digital technology, you can provide new services to, uh, to new customers and, and, build, uh, and build your business in areas which uh, have been previously ignored. So what should you do about it? Um, well, firstly, we know that leading organizations in 2019 will explore the opportunities of leapfrogging, and that's because the speed of technological adoption cycles shows no sign of slowing down. Uh, one particular strategy that I would highlight is that when identifying a leapfrogging strategy uh, for new products, bear in mind, for example, the importance of early adopters. Uh, early adopters are often found in less than expected places, for example, in, in Latin America, uh, countries such as Brazil, Colombia, and Peru uh, have the highest percentage worldwide um, of early adopters, some, some of the highest uh, percentages of early adopters. So the important point here is not to examine purely the technological shifts that are occurring, but rather what does it mean for business models. It requires a shift in the mindset uh, for looking at incremental changes to examining what your business will look like in five years' time. And opportunities for leapfrogging exist in really very diverse areas, whether that you're looking at mobile commerce, to digital identity, to, to any of the areas which we've spoken about in today's call. Um, and really take advantage 
of the potential of leapfrogging, it does mean developing a bold strategy which is developed in conjunction with a vision of where society is heading in the next five years. So with that, we have covered our four key predictions and I want to hand back over to Ali to conclude before we open up to the session to questions. Yes, of course, Charles. So I think to conclude, it's clear that digital technology will lead to peace. And from Siri being present in our daily lives to companies that are skipping technology evolution processes to designers using augmented reality, digital technology will significantly impact the business landscape. And that is why it is crucial for organizations to understand the potential of these new technologies and the way they are rapidly changing. And failing to understand these new possibilities means that companies are missing the opportunities that digital represents, and it might threaten their long-term survival. Super, thanks, Ali. And with that, I want to open up for any questions. Just a reminder, if you want to ask a question, you can do so uh, either via the hashtag predictions BSF or just uh, write to us on our, on our on our Twitter account, which is at VelatrixSF, or you can uh, write a comment into the chat box on the bottom right-hand side uh, of your screen. But actually, whilst we were presenting, I saw that a couple of questions did come in, so I think uh, you know we'll, we'll get to those first. And the first question is actually for you, Javier, uh, which is about um, Google Flutter. And the question is, will Google uh, Fuchsia use Flutter? Okay, thank you very much, Charles. Yeah, well, Fuchsia, first of all, let's give a little bit of context. Fuchsia is an OS, it's a promise of an OS that uh, Google stated it would launch. It is a merge between Chrome, the OS of Chrome, and uh, the Android OS itself. So upon merging these two, it will be like an universal OS for all their devices. So uh, even though there hasn't been any institutional or yeah and any yeah press release of Google itself any statement any official statement from their side it is uh, it is most likely that a uh, fuchsia will actually use flutter since it won't well they won't, wouldn't have to code twice both for OS for iOS sorry or for Android but um, it would be just from one code so the yeah the bottom line would be um, we don't have any uh, institutional answer about it. There is no uh, yeah, official statement about it, but it is most likely going to be the, the way to go. Super, thank you. And actually, we just got a, we've got another question uh, about Flutter as well. And that is, uh, is Flutter's release preview worth trying, in your opinion, or should they wait for the, the final version to be released? Uh, yeah, thank you very much, Charles. Well, it's quite interesting because the release preview, when Google launched the, their release preview version one, uh, it was so good that actually Alibaba itself started to use their services and it worked super well with them. But uh, just a couple of weeks ago, actually on December the 8th, the final stable version of Google Flutter was released. So it's it's super brand new. So uh, actually, if the, the concern of, of these attendees about either to install or another release preview, the good uh, news would be that the stable version, the 1.0 version, not the beta, but the final version is already on the market. It's free down you can down, go ahead and download it and yeah use it and see how it goes super thank you mm -hmm. it's certainly it's a certainly very exciting technology google flutter um and actually see one for another question has come in this time uh, about augmented reality uh, so for you ali um could you explain a bit more about what is an omnichannel experience and uh, how how that can benefit from augmented reality Yes, of course. Uh, so basically, an omni-channel experience consists of creating an enjoyable and frictionless journey for the user. Uh, so for instance, if you're planning to purchase shoes, you should be able to start your purchase in your phone, then continue from a website on your laptop, and then finish the purchase in a physical store. And to achieve this, all the touch points should be connected, and all, the, all of them must provide the same quality and they all must be meaningful for the user's journey. 
So these way retailers will be able to track their users and know what their preferences are. So when you get to the store, they already know what type of shoes you're interested in, and they will be able to offer you what best fits your preferences. So what is the role of AR in an omnichannel experience? Sometimes going to the store and looking for a specific object and wait in long lines can be an obstacle for the purchase process. And today, more and more people prefer to search and buy articles online. So what AR does is to make the purchase process simpler as it unifies online and offline experiences. So it allows users to place virtual objects in the real world so you can have an accurate idea of how they would look like in your home, for instance, or if they fit your spaces. And this increases significantly the quality of the purchase journey. And actually, if you want to know more about this, you can go to our blog section in which we talk about the key elements of an omnichannel experience and many other interesting subjects related with UX design. Super, thanks, Ali. And also, I would just echo that recommendation. Earlier this year, we held a, uh, a UX week where um, you know, we we produced a lot of content. We spoke with a lot of our experts, also our, our UX lab, uh, where we highlighted um, and we examined many of the emerging trends in user experience. So I, I certainly recommend uh, going to the to the blog section of our website. Uh, but with that, I see that we don't have um, any further questions at this time. So I think it's a, a good point to bring the session to a close and bring our, our final webinar of the year to a close. I'd like to say thank you to everyone for, for joining us today. Also, a big thank you to Javi and to Ali for, for sharing your expertise and, and for taking the time to, to join us today. Um, Javi, Ali, do you have any final comments you'd like to leave the audience with? Thank you very much, Charles. Uh, no, no, not really. Just like thank you very often to all the attendees. And yeah, you're more than welcome to follow us and to check out because Bellatrix is doing like super interesting stuff in content. Yes, likewise. Uh, thank you all for joining the webinar. Uh, we hope we provided meaningful uh, and useful information for all of you. Thank you. Super, thank you both. Uh, and just a quick reminder uh, to everyone on the line that if you would like to listen to a recording, um, a recording will be available on our website or on our YouTube channel within the next 24 hours. Um, with that, uh, yeah, I'd like to bring the session to a close. Uh, if any questions do come to mind, uh, you know, following up from this, please don't hesitate to reach out to us. We'll be delighted to continue the conversation uh, and looking forward to, uh, you know, to continuing the conversation uh, in the following year. Thank you, everyone, and goodbye.